Well, I'm sort of coming at this from the museum's point of view, but reiterating what a lot of people have um, been talking about, about that relationship between MAS and the museums, uh, to the extent that I'm actually using exactly the same quote as Robbie's this morning. So I apologise in advance for that, but we didn't talk to one another about it. So the Museum of Liverpool has uh, an archaeology team who deliver a wide range of activities associated with the archaeology of Merseyside. Now, the mission of National Museums Liverpool is um, well, it's quite, uh, quite ambitious. Uh, it's to be the world's leading example of an inclusive museum service. So in our everyday work, obviously, that's what we're striving for. But in reality, inclusivity and involving people in work around heritage is at our core. And we've heard today how this partnership between MAS and the museum uh, has enabled a great deal of really strong archaeological involvement to be taking place over the last 40 years now. The department here has five curatorial posts who care for collections and also undertake fieldwork. And it also hosts two posts for the Portable Antiquities Scheme. For those of you who are coming tomorrow, Vanessa Oakton, the Fines Liaison Officer for the Portable Antiquities Scheme, will be here to do um, a session. Um, we've also hosted a number of project-based staff over, over recent years. The department curates the Regional Archaeology Collection, which is a collection of finds, paper and digital archives from archaeological excavations from the region. So you're asking this morning where all these archives go. Yes, most of them are here. Um, and they total around 100,000 items. Uh, the largest groups of those include prehistoric flint, thank you to Ron Cowell, uh, Romano British material, thank you to Rob Philpott, and post medieval ceramics, thank you to Jeff Speakman, who's not here today. Um, this collection is represented here in the Museum of Liverpool by around 700 items on display, which tell the story of Merseyside, especially in the timeline on this floor, which those of you who did the tour might have seen, um, but also. I've actually managed to get archaeological, archaeological collections in every single gallery of the museum now, something that I was striving for from day one, um, even in the Wondrous Place Gallery, which looks at sport and football and culture and things. We've managed to get, find a tenuous link and, and embed archaeology across the entire museum. The museum archaeologists also uh, plan and deliver a lot of activities, events, talks, sessions. We do quite a lot, big programme for the Festival of Archaeology each year. So the Museum of Liverpool collects archives from commercial excavations in Merseyside um, and there's also um, a lot of collecting from uh, chance finds and so we have some items um, which are found by metal detectors come through us um, through the treasure process. Around half the uh, collection of 100,000 items is derived from fieldwork which has at least some element of community engagement in the, the fieldwork uh, element of in the fieldwork uh, behind it. And as we've heard this morning, there's this very long history going back to at least the 1960s of partnership, co partnership and collaboration between professional and non-professional archaeologists in the region. And in recent years, community archaeology has expanded nationally and internationally as a model for uh, delivering these sorts of projects. As that's happened, the Museum of Liverpool sort of started to gain a, a reputation for delivering some really great projects. So we heard this morning about the Rainford's Roots project and how exemplary that was. We also worked at Liso Lighthouse in partnership with uh, Wirral Borough Council, at Stanley Bank in St Helens. We did an excavation at the Queen's Head Pub in Everton, um, Sefton Landscape Partnership, with, which Mark's worked on, and uh, last year the Coldies Big Dig at, at Calder Stones, which I'll say a little more on later. The development of the new uh, Museum of Liverpool venue presented many opportunities for the archaeological collections to be explored. And many of our displays across the museum have been developed in partnership with different types of community groups. So here we had the 1918 club established by Eleanor Rathbone uh, working with us to develop a display on suffrage. Um, we had a group from the Teenage Pregnancy Support Services who did an artistic response to some of the themes in the museum to create this story tent. And when we were looking to develop our little Liverpool gallery, obviously the people you speak to are children. So across the museum, embedded in the displays, are a lot of sort of community uh, elements. Many museums approach at least some of their exhibition development through this sort of democratic approach of community-led exhibitions. And Museum Liverpool is certainly no exception. And I think that archaeology is especially well suited to this sort of direct involvement of communicative groups. Because they can be, people can be involved in fieldwork, um, research, collections work and exhibition development. In the last couple of day, decades, engaging volunteers has been considered a little bit more strategically as, as vital really for the future of archaeology. We need to get that sort of buy-in from people uh, to, to reinforce 
um, the, uh, the, the storylines of archaeology. I consider community archaeology to be a means of engaging people through the really active process of archaeology and facilitating them in exploring their past. Through project run, projects run as collaboration between professional and non-professional archaeologists, there's a partnership that enables really high-quality archaeological work, um, but with uh, really strong local connections and inputs, those things that, that really only local people know and are able to put into, into a project. Um, community archaeology is often seen as different from public archaeology, which is obviously sort of a little bit more didactic. Um, but I think Museum of Liverpool is... is in its very philosophy, quite community focused and able to deliver a lot of this uh, community archaeology. Um, and we heard a little bit this morning about how, through projects like Rangeford Roots, MAS benefits from working with sort of large institutions, which could be the museum. Likewise, the Museum of Liverpool benefits greatly from being able to engage with, with community groups, including uh, MAS. It's been noted that archaeology brings people together and for a group of novice volunteers to, uh, it's a great opportunity to learn uh, new skills. At one recent community excavation I worked on, there was a volunteer involved who had suffered uh, long-term drug addiction and his volunteering on the excavation was, he told me personally, a culmination of what he'd worked for in getting clean. So this, one, so this is somebody who'd come from a really low ebb in their life and was brought together with people from many walks of life together as equals with a shared interest and to enjoy new experiences and learn new skills. National Museums Liverpool is committed to the concept of social justice and following the Museums Association's Museums Change Lives campaign, we believe that the museums and the plethora of work that we take around the museum venues have a role in engendering that sort of aspiration and have a, an opportunity for, for levelling the field. In the field of archaeology, there's been long-term work which has involved non-professionals working alongside museum staff to uh, investigate the past. As we've heard this morning, as when MAS was founded in 1976, it in, aimed to uh, encourage public interest in and concern for antiquity and archaeology. And then it had a number of ways in which it was, it was doing that. And I think most of that really sort of still carries through to the uh, main thrust of the work of the, the society today. In the same year, the predecessors of National Museums Liverpool formed, formed the first professional archaeology um, body for the county and appointed the first field archaeologist for Merseyside. From the mid-1970s onwards, the University of Liverpool provided extramural classes in archaeology and worked with the museums and MAS to deliver field projects. This is the one you've seen before, I do apologise. Um, in parallel with the development of professional and non-professional archaeology, um, the interest grew um, out of the enthusiasm of a number of key individuals who spearheaded the investigation of the early hi history of the region and laid really solid foundations for the partnerships in archaeology research for many decades to come. Brian Shepherd, the first field archaeologist for Merseyside, remembered in a CBA conference presentation in 1976 that the turning point came uh, when the turning point in the development of an official archaeological awareness in Merseyside came in 1976 when a group of local professionals and non-professional archaeologists mounted, mounted a rescue excavation at the site of Liverpool Crown Courts. So that was the real culmination of uh, everything that people have worked for to start to found uh, MAS. And at this time, Shepherd set out this division of responsibilities. Uh, it's quite interesting to note that, that many things have changed when you look at this description. So the county museums became National Museums and Galleries on Merseyside, became National Museums Liverpool. Liverpool Museum became World Museum. The Field Archaeology became um, Archaeological Services, National Museums Liverpool. The Department of Environment has been through so many different roles as um, Royal Commission, English Heritage and now Historic England. And the Institute of Extension Studies at the University became continuing in education. But all of these things have survived through. And actually, the constant there is, is MAS. And the key uh, partnership of the museums and MAS has also remained important and mutually beneficial to both organisations. So 
Local Museums, working with communities, offers the direct contact with enthusiastic individuals. And I have to say, on all of the community archaeology projects I've worked on, recruiting volunteers is always very straightforward. There's always a really strong group of people who are very, very keen to get involved. Opportunities are always changing. And now the massive growth in social media provides a new opportunity. And changing emphasis onto, onto different platforms, different ways of working, is something that MAS and others need to, to, need to keep up with. But of course, social media is a job in itself. And I have to admit that when I was actually sitting writing this paper, I wrote the sentence, social media is a job in itself, remembered I needed to post something on a Facebook page, broke off, did that, and then came back to this. Because it is something that you're just constantly keeping up with. And that's a professional Facebook page, not a personal one, just to clarify. Um, so, as museums and the community come and work together, what benefits can that achieve? Well, heritage has long been identified as an important element of people's identity and sense of place. The Department for Culture and Media Sport undertook research in 2013 to 14 and found that when people were asked why they were proud of living in Britain, the third most popular answer was British history. About 40% of people named that as, as their proudest reason for living in Britain. Considerable research has also indicated that active engagement in heritage can have wide-ranging benefits for individuals and communities. Much evaluation has taken place in an attempt to measure this really intangible um, benefit of heritage activity. DCMS, again, in the same study, tried, and I don't know how they did this, tried to place financial measurements in terms of improvement of quality of life and estimated that working on a heritage project brings you the equivalent of £1,646 worth of improvement in your life. How on earth they come up with that, I don't know. Um, I have to say, personally, having large involvement in heritage has never brought a great deal of financial benefit to me, but um, it's great to think that you know, there are these sort of genuine sort of well-being um, and personal benefits to people. Heritage actually has been identified as, as being unusually beneficial to well-being. Um, more, and active engagement in heritage being more beneficial than more passively, say, visiting a venue or participating in arts or participating in sports, which surprised me. Um, Archaeology can be a means of empowering people to gain knowledge and skills and experience to understand their own history, identify and value heritage assets, and become stewards of the past in their own local communities. There are a wide-ranging array of types of activities which are embraced under that sort of community archaeology, and there's a lot of different definitions. But one that I especially like is one that pleads for the professionals to to give away a little bit of the the decision-making process. So let it go. Um, And enable the community to actually do uh, some of that for themselves. But that said, volunteers do need support, training, encouragement, especially when they're undertaking field work. Uh, It's a destructive process, as we all know. And people feel quite nervous about going into doing these things without professional guidance. And that's where this model that we've spoken about this morning uh, of professional work working with non-professionals is really, really important. And the Heritage Lottery Fund, who've been mentioned already today, have been absolutely crucial in that. Our recent Olympic successes have often been ascribed to lottery funding, going into the training of athletes, and that's building the great successes that we've seen over the last 10 or 15 years. I think the same is true in Heritage. The Heritage Lottery Fund have invested very, very heavily in creating this model of projects which enables professionals to work with volunteers and to enhance uh, their training and enable them to to undertake a lot of work. But, and then for that investment, there are some really great benefits. We're inv- able to investigate archaeological sites to high uh, professional standards whilst engaging people in the whole of the archaeological process. This widens participation in the museum's activities, attracting a diverse local audiences to become involved. And it's a key part of what we're doing to fulfil our um, desire to be that inclusive and de- democratic museum service. By selecting projects that we can be involved in, the Museum of Liverpool is able to bring considerable impact to those. Um, but that said, it sort of also is important that we are quite selective and we have to be very organised and effective in what we deliver. So the Rainford Roots project has, as I think you know, the, a project officer, Sam, who's spoken to many of you about the ceramics that were found today. 
And there was also a trainee working on the project, Kerry Mashida Rigby, who'll be here tomorrow, was a community archaeology trainee, helped deliver that project. And then a number of other staff fed into to working on that. We have worked on other large projects where there haven't been um, individual members of staff tasked with those. And it takes a lot of effort to try and organise these things in amongst a lot of other work. So that model where the Heritage Lottery Fund is able to, to give um, bespoke staff um, that, that remit is very, very important. There are these models coming through now of commercial archaeology involving volunteers in different ways. And some of the work that I'm doing at the moment about court housing, I don't know if anybody's visited the court reconstruction upstairs, that's one of my uh, projects. Um, I'm looking at some of the ways that um, some commercial archaeology projects have involved local people. So Hungate in York, um, there's an example in Glasgow, where people have been involved in, in commercial archaeology, and that becomes a, a greater possibility through uh, the National Policy and Planning Guidance now. Um, but it won't necessarily provide the wide range of different activities that, um, that a sort of pre-planned archaeological, uh, community archaeological project can. So what we've done in the projects that we've run here at the Museum of Liverpool is to involve volunteers at every stage of the process. So undertaking research with Fran, who's at the back, uh, doing geophysics, which is what I was doing last weekend on a project, obviously excavation, finds processing and cataloguing, finds photography, and this is something that we do particularly through the Port of Antiquity scheme is encourage and train a lot of people in um, how to photograph their finds so that they can self-record their, their metal detector finds. And then this is somebody working in our office to, to record finds reported to us, a volunteer. And then also working on exhibitions and displays. So some elements of the Museum in Liverpool were specifically designed so that they could be updated. So the interactive map you give me something to put on it, it can be on there by tomorrow. And so when there are outputs from these exhibitions, we can, well, from these projects, we can get them into exhibitions quite quickly. Some exhibitions take a little bit more work, but again, uh, involve volunteers. So these two young ladies were uh, working with me on the Cheshire Hordes project, Heritage Lottery funded project uh, last year. Of all of these, though, I have to admit that it is ex excavation that is still the most popular. You can't get over the fact that people love digging. Um, and it does take a special volunteer to sometimes do some of the less sexy tasks. So I really should pick out that this is Carmen, and she's done a brilliant job of doing some um, evaluation work for me about uh, this exhibition, how visitors see it, and helping us improve as it tours to other venues. Um, that wasn't the most exciting job, but it was absolutely crucial. It has been very, very important for us in, in developing the exhibition. There are loads of other really important things need doing. And when students like Carmen come to us on placement, we do try and give them a range of different activities um, with tangible outputs for their CV or their portfolio as well. Digging is brilliant with volunteers. It's great fun. Um, but it's important that even with the youngest volunteers, and I work with the, the local Young Archaeologists Club, we show them the whole process of archaeology, and that digging is only a small part of that. There's a lot of before and after work to do to provide just a few days excavation work for volunteers. We also sometimes have to accept, no, not there yet, have to accept the unpredictability of archaeology and work with that. At the Coldies Big Dig that we ran last year, we were, re we were working in the middle of a prehistoric landscape. We had the Calder Stones, um, now moved, but a, a, a Neolithic chambered tomb, a probable other site of Neolithic tomb at Pikeloo Hill. Uh, the other side of the park, we had the find of the Wavertree Urns in the 19th century, and numerous chance finds of, of flint tools told us that there, there was something of a prehistoric landscape here. However, what we discovered dated back as early as the 17th century, in some cases. And I have to admit that many of the finds were no older than I was. Um, but the process of archaeology was what was important to volunteers. And actually, developing a typology of ring pools was as good an exercise for them as it was looking at a typology of Roman brooches. The volunteers contributed at every phase of that project. And in the final phase, they selected what we should collect and they chose items to put on display, and we had a display here in the museum for about six months. And at that, place, that point, I really was Elsa, and I did let it go, and I did let them choose whatever they wanted to collect. So we are now the proud owners of some ring pulls in the archaeology collection, but it is part of the story of the site. 
So having said all of those sort of difficulties and challenges that we sometimes have, um, I'm still certainly one who keeps coming back for more uh, in terms of doing more community archaeology projects. And I'm currently now involved with the eighth Heritage Lottery funded project that I've been involved in, which is Galkoff's and the Secret Life of Pembroke Place. So this project is especially looking at these heritage assets, which are Galkoff's, which was a Jewish butcher's, to which was added this um, green tiled frontage in the 1930s. And then these buildings, which are the last surviving examples of Liverpool's courtyard housing. Uh, we're in the development phase of the project at the moment with the geophysical survey hoping to excavate the rest of the court which has uh, been demolished in the 20th century uh, and in due course we're hoping that the project will bring uh, the tiled frontage uh, to the Museum of Liverpool because it's in a very poor state of repair uh, on the building is suffering a lot with, uh, with weathering. Um, and so that's a new project, it's a new one that we're working on. We're looking to recruit volunteers to do some documentary work research at this stage and then further down the line we're hoping that we will be able to run an excavation and do building recording around those buildings, particularly the courtyard houses. So who knows what we will discover next. Thank you.